Hey, revolutionaries, I'm excited to bring you this week's episode with Steve Cortica, where we're talking about reinventing life as a working musician. Yes, uh, I know, man, it's been brutal in the arts, uh, you know, for musicians, for, you know, restaurants and bars, music clubs. Uh, concert venues, all these things, you know, just were, you know, came to a screeching halt for for the shutdown. And so I thought it would be interesting to hear Steve's take on what he's doing different now that we're all living with the shutdown and how he's been able to pivot to creating more online content. You know, Steve has an amazing story where he's been able to work at many different levels in the music industry, where he's been able to, you know, tour tour internationally, tour big uh, concert venues and concert halls with the likes of Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga, and he plays regularly, at least until the shutdown, uh, weekly with the Brian Newman Quintet, with some of the best jazz musicians in New York City. Also, he's been playing in the Chad Lefkowitz Brown Big Band, which I've seen some online stuff, which, which we talk about uh, in this episode. He's really in the mix of a super set of high-level musicians in New York City, and so I can't wait for everyone out there to listen to this episode. But real quick, before we get there, I just wanted to say... Thank you to any first-time listeners out there. I really appreciate you checking out the podcast. And what would be fun is if you left a review out there in uh, Apple Podcasts or or your, a, any of your favorite podcast player out there and let me know how you discovered the show. So how did you find it? Did someone tell you about it? Was it word of mouth? Or did you find it through social media or just searching online? Or you had a curiosity about reinvention and somehow it popped up? I'd really love to know um, how you discovered it. Drop a review. Let me know what you liked. Let me know what you didn't like, and let me know how you found it. I think it'll be fun, fun and insightful. And for longtime listeners out there, you know, if if you've been listening uh, a while and haven't told your two best friends about the show yet, uh, I think you should rethink your whole life and approach. No, Uh, you know, give it a shot. You know, don't keep it all to yourself. If you're getting something out of the show because you're a longtime listener, you must be. You know, share it with a couple friends you think might need to hear some of this message or hear some of the insight or just be entertained by um, the guests to come on and, and, you know, leverage hearing about their experience. So tell two friends and then they can tell two friends. See how easy that is? Exactly. It's easy. And, you know, speaking of easy, let's get to this week's episode with Steve Cortica because Steve's music and his saxophone playing and his approach to improvisation, composition, and such is easy on the ears. See what I did there, Steve? Yeah, good transition. Anyways, let's get to this week's episode. This episode of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast is brought to you by M.G. Schlachter, a built environment and architectural consulting firm with an in-house production team. Delivering support services in the retail, hospitality, and residential sectors for leading brands worldwide, M.G. Schlachter is reinventing something near and dear to my heart, of course, architectural support services. Suffice it to say that whatever built environment or architectural project you're working on, M.G. Schlachter can step in and help accelerate your growth. So if you're looking for a built environment and architectural services firm with an in-house production team to help you reinvent your next project, check out M.G. Schlachter. Find them on the web at mgschlachter.com. That's M-G-S-H-L-A-C-H-T-E-R.com mgschlachter.com. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, Visit JimJimsReinventionRevolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hey everybody, hey, this is Jim Jim, and welcome to episode 68 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And I'm talking today with Steve Cortica, and we're talking about uh, reinventing yourself in this post-COVID age as a working musician. So, Steve, welcome to the Reinvention Revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Hey, here. well, thanks for thanks for uh, taking your time, and I, I I can't wait to hear about uh, really how, how you've been dealing with this with this whole cancellation of all live performances for the moment, which is pretty insane to think about as as a real working musician out there. But before we dig into it, I got a couple of things I wanted to mention, and one was I don't know if you are thinking about this probably probably don't want to think about this right now but when i was uh kind of re, you know researching remembering uh to put together some details about our conversation today 
I'm, I was looking at the date and it's April 30th. And I'm thinking like, you know, in normal times, you would be in Las Vegas right about now, most likely. And I might have been in Las Vegas right now because yeah. I've been thinking about you since January this year. Because I missed you in Vegas in January. So you were, you know, you were in Vegas. And I wanted to mention that first because I'm just bumming, man, that I, that I missed this gig. And I really was thinking, I just wanted to let you know that I was actually thinking about coming out to Vegas in late April, May to catch your gig with the Brian Newman uh, Quintet. Is that how it's built out there with, with Lady Gaga, like yeah. to support her performances? T- tell, tell people what, the, what that particular performance is about. Well, yeah, and it, it's great uh, to, that you were trying to make it for that. I think, like, we've been in Vegas Vegas a lot for the last uh, year or so. Right. And what we've been doing is two different types of shows. We do a, a main a show with her, and it's her actual show. Uh, it's called Lady Gaga Jazz and Piano, where she does a bunch of standards, and then she'll do a bunch of her own uh, songs as solo versions uh, at the piano. Okay. And, it's and, is, getting, and that's in the big, is that in the main room at the Nomad Hotel? Or yeah, the MGM? Uh, no, what do they the call park, that? Yeah, Park MGM. Park theater. MGM, okay. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, Brian was able to, uh, after our first uh, jazz and piano show, Brian Newman, who's the jazz band leader for Lady Gaga, went, and just to mention that that show with Gaga has, uh, it has an orchestra, uh, like a full string section and a full big band that back us up, uh, the jazz quintet up. Oh, when really? We play okay. For her. A full big band. Yeah. So. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, it, it's 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 pretty awesome, and some of the best uh, musicians in Vegas come out and play in the in the big band. So not an orchestra, no strings. There there are strings also too. So oh, it's there are? like oh. big band on one side, strings on the oh, strings right okay. next to it. Oh, real to do. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So like uh, at the first uh, performance we did at that show, Brian had uh, said kind of set up an informal meeting with with Lady Gaga and uh, the head of uh, MGM Grand, basically. Mm-hmm. Lady Gaga was able to uh, set up a, a meeting with him and basically just tell the owner of MGM Grand to offer Brian a gig in the Nomad Lounge. Okay. So Brian was able to get like four extra nights a week when we were in town, so that way we wouldn't have to keep flying back and forth. Uh, but also, you know, Brian's a great entertainer and performer, so he was able to get this room, and we essentially just took the gigs we've been playing in New York and then just transferred them over to Las Vegas. And, and in that particular show at the Nomad Lounge, we just perform our regular show. And then Brian was able to just reach out to a bunch of Vegas uh, entertainers and have them come by and sit in. It ends up being like really unique variety show uh, with some of the, you know, the best talent in Vegas that just come by and, and perform with us, which has been just really amazing to get everybody together like that. Oh, I, I, I can imagine. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come and, and hang and check it out because uh, I was just like, you know, I got to get out here. You know, I was trying to get to New York maybe and and, and catch the gig and catch you, know, you and Brian together because, I mean, I, m- I remember seeing you guys years ago. I don't know if you remember this. Um, I think it was down in Columbus where you guys were touring with um, – I think it was Brian's wife, Angie, who was the burlesque show. I can't remember what it was billed, uh-huh. but, but you guys were playing the live music behind the burlesque dancers and stuff. That was fun anyways. That was my first, when I got to yeah. know, know Brian and stuff, got us years ago now. But anyways, it got me thinking about it. And, and I didn't realize, thanks for sharing that, because I was thinking the, the Lady Gaga part, I didn't realize the main show in the Park MGM was also jazz-oriented. I was thinking maybe she was doing more of some Lady Gaga or a mix of stuff. And then she was going to play with you, sing with you guys later in the lounge. But that's cool. So you were on the main stage too, in, in Vegas with her doing her jazz stuff. Really cool. Yeah. Does she come down and hang at the Nomad later or no? Yeah. After after her show, uh, whenever we do a show with her, she's came out like a majority of the nights, like ninety percent of the time. Yeah. She'll come out unless she's not feeling well or something gotcha. like that. Um, gotcha. It's a long day for her. Uh, but yeah. I should mention too that she also does a pop show in the same lounge, so she'll do like three shows a week, or between three and four, and it's usually like two pop shows and one jazz show. I see. And, okay. Uh, yeah. So That's those will be like maybe like monthly installments over the course of the year. She'll do it like four months out of the year, and yeah. have like pretty much like a really intense month and a half of of her shows, and then we're part of that mix uh, as like kind of like a a supplemental show that happens. After that as well. I see. Okay, I gotcha. Well, that's cool. That explains that because I was trying to figure yeah. out exactly what it was and what what you know. Just I knew it would be cool, but sorry I missed you because I was there earlier in the year to kind of kick off the year. It was like 2020 yeah. big podcast. They had all these 
kind of big ideas on my mind. I was going to be traveling. I thought, you know what? I'm going to get back, and then I'm going to go to Cuba. Maybe I'll just swing out to Vegas and do a West Coast swing and see your guys' show in the process. And then I was going to go to Israel. I had all these like kind of plans made, but of course, none of those plans are happening now, <laughs> right. which is kind of a bummer. And I think that's one of the reasons why when I got, I did end up going to Asia, and I got back about March 5th, which we were talking about earlier. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why I reached out with you to you when I saw all this when when the world started shutting down and saw New York starting to be a real hot spot for the virus, and I thought, "Ooh, man, I, I wonder what's going on out there in New York." I hope you're hope you've like maybe were able to skate the city or just you know taking care of yourself. And it turns out you were already back in Ohio. So <laughs> when I text when I texted you, so you kind of hit the escape escape valve. So you know before we dig into how you've been able to like pivot and keep everything rolling right now. Can you share with everybody your thoughts or or your lifestyle? Maybe it's, it'd be interesting for people to understand, you know, how much you were working, how many live performances were going on, and then how that came to this abrupt halt, and you know how you kind of you know jumped back to Ohio for for the moment here, uh, and then started to recraft or rethink about how to continue <laughs> normal life as a musician. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot. Uh, a lot to think about for sure. Um, the performance schedule when I was in New York, I was working for anywhere between like four gigs a week, which would be four nights out of the week, and uh, to maybe like eight or nine gigs, just depending on how busy the week was and mm-hmm. if I got called for private events or called to fill in for other people. Uh, which is why I moved to New York, you know, to get to have those opportunities because just in just uh, about any other city in the U.S., it's just not that. Uh, popular to have that to have that much live music anywhere so right uh, i was really uh, enjoying that part of it and um you know there's there's a lot of other day-to-day things that that would happen and keep me busy during the day just like composing music and maybe teach some lessons or something i work with this great mouthpiece company called sios which is called shape your own sound and they sent me a bunch of their mouthpieces and i'm, I'm like a representative for them so i have people come over and or and try the mouthpieces and then i get a commission for that stat. so mm-hmm. uh a large variety of things, you know, were happening in New York for me, um, and just keeping me very busy. Pretty much every day was full of whatever, you know, whether it's preparing for a gig or writing a chart or having people come over try my pieces, teaching lessons, practicing, just all these things right. combined. So some of those stuff, those things aren't really location specific. So like when I found out about the virus happening and uh, started to realize that pretty much all the gigs were going to get shut down. It, it happened over the course of about a week where, uh, you know, everybody was like, well, we got to wait and see what's happening with this thing. And then, um, you know, it was pretty much night and day where they were just saying, you know, no, no venues could be open after 10 o'clock. And that was a gray area for us because our gig ended at 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. So I was still waiting to hear about that one. The, the main one that I play at with Brian Newman at the Rose Bar, we play eight to 10 every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, but once that I found out that was canceled, I wasn't going to be making any money that was like location specific. So right. um, I just hightailed it to Cleveland before I really knew anything about the disease or anything. I just I, I was planning on coming back actually at the beginning of April anyway for uh, some big band stuff uh, in a couple of different of uh, the Ohio cities. I was going to just start in Cleveland, play at Brothers Lounge, and then go, to, go down to Columbus and then go down to Cincinnati where do some clinics and master classes and stuff. So it kind of worked out at the same time. I ended up just leaving, you know, like a couple of weeks sooner I see. to come okay. back to Cle- Cleveland. But I ended up staying about what's going to be a couple of months longer in Cleveland than I right. had planned. So than you would have imagined. Well, yeah, it turns out yeah. that it was a good window. Like when you left, it was like you know, all of a sudden it just everything got shut down, and I think it kind of exploded in a way into this hot spot of you know there was at least from what you see on TV, it looked pretty pretty brutal out there. I mean, I think it's still pretty rough. What what I mean, do you, are, you must have a bunch of friends there and other people that you know. Like, are you hearing kind of how are things in New York right now? Like, would you say? I mean, the biggest thing I think, and, the, and this is just part of living there, is that, that you kind of get cabin fever from being in such a small space. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody that lives there kind of sacrifices this amount of square footage. You know, you know to, to sure. be located there. Um, so, th- being confined to that area is a huge drag because like the plus side obviously is when you get to when you get to go out you get to meet all these great people and just really interesting sites and culture and all that stuff 
So I think that's really hard for a lot of people that are there being confined to that uh, smaller s space. And then I I've just heard some stories, like one of my friends, he works at the UN, uh, and he's coming back to Ohio uh, after, you know, staying in New York and being quarantined for however long he's been there for now, uh, for like two months straight, I think. Yeah. Uh, he just decided to, to drive back to Cleveland, or Ohio, I'm not sure where he lives, but... Um, he was saying the lines at the grocery stores are just ridiculous, you yeah. know, and there's, he's got a couple of dogs that he has to walk and the, the, a lot of the roads there are just like community pathways are much more narrow. Um, when you look at the per capita ratio of these, you know, these public feature things, it, it, when you get even just a small crowd of people in certain areas and they all have to be six feet apart, it, it kind of spreads things out a lot more. And you need more space, and you don't have it in New York. In New York, you you have a lot less space. So, sure. I think um, I I've actually known some people that have gotten the virus, and they end up you know just staying self-contained in their apartment until it passes. But then, like you know, what do you do after that? Uh, you still are possibly carrying it, can give it to other people. You know, there's there's a lot of um, things, <laughs> right. a lot of factors that just nobody ever thought about, and I think they get exacerbated just being in a, a concentration. Right. By, yeah. uh, just the dense people. Right. Yeah. I mean, in the in the time where you're not, you know, we're supposed to keep social dis distance. You're in this very sort of concentrated, you know, density of people. So, well, it's cool that you had this escape yeah. valve to, uh, you know, get back to Ohio at least for a while, um, and you know, for maybe another few weeks. We'll see when things start to open up or how it, how it uh, how the virus starts to die down. But in the meantime, I mean. All public performance gigs are are canceled basically for the for the near future, and so what did you what have you been doing differently? This is kind of my my curiosity, which I think can help a lot of other people out there, a lot of other musicians in particular, of course, but also a lot of other people that maybe aren't so experienced with doing things online, for example, or that have to figure out new technologies or new like video applications and all that kind of stuff. I've no at least I've noticed that you know recently man you've been like cranking out a bunch of music videos okay <laughs> like all kinds of stuff like little videos of you know solo videos combination videos with other people you know obviously from different lo physical locations cuz we're social distancing but also big band stuff so tell me how you what were your thoughts were when you got back to Ohio you get out of there you know you're not local co-located with all these guys anymore how did you start approaching things yeah, it was it was a little bit of like a regrouping process that I just had to kind of wrap my head around. It took a couple of days, but um, there's always there's a lot of things that I had just backlogged over the you know the years of of being busy with gigs and and the workload in New York that I had as a regular schedule. Um, and one of them is you know learning a lot of different so like social media tools, uh, learning how to live stream, getting good at that, learning. Final Cut. I, I bought Final Cut Pro. It, I think like beginning of this year, February this year, uh, just with the idea that I was going to edit my own videos that I shot uh, for my last album that I did in September of last year. And then I've been using it just nonstop, pretty much to make all the all the all the videos that I've done now. But my whole trajectory right now, I think, is I'm, I'm really thinking a lot about you know students, music students, and uh, ways to just keep them motivated to practice you know especially the younger ones that have gotten maybe a little bit of a taste of music and and how much fun it can be um i, I kind of want to see if i can feel that and keep it going and then also you know just uh getting the music that i've written in, out there and uh sharing it with people as much as possible and there's there's some advantages actually to doing home studio recordings and having uh you know the isolated recording aspect of it uh, it's not great for like quartet playing or, or like live playing you don't really get to interact at all in those situations but uh you do you can do a lot of edit in those situations so if there's things that sometimes don't go off so well on a live performance and don't sound so great uh you can really fix those things up and and make them sound really really good good um using tools like final cut and uh i use logic to do my audio editing but those are things that i probably wouldn't spend as much time on if I were just trying to put out like a live performance. Right. So how familiar were you with these tools 
uh, before the shutdown. So like maybe you dabbled in, you know, some kind of, you know, YouTube video or, you know, some recording, obviously you have experience being in the recording studio, like, you know, in a larger studio, but in this, in these personalized tools, what was your experience level with them? Yeah. Well, uh, that's a great question. Like I would, I would kind of go in short blasts with them. Like I would, I would need to make a track for somebody, you know, like years ago. And I would, I would spend some time in GarageBand, you know, spend like maybe a day just trying to figure out a couple of tools to right. use in GarageBand. Right. But it was minimal, you know, like I didn't really know a ton about the, any of the programs really. Final Cut had a huge, not, not a huge learning curve, but it took me about three days to actually feel like I could have some kind of workflow on Final Cut. Um, and luckily I had learned, gone through that whole process before the, the virus had hit um so it saved me some time when it when it started up um but yeah i mean a lot, there's definitely been a, a lot of just like on the spot learning happening uh just with like interfaces and every every app and every uh application has its own interface that's very specific and kind of has different ways of uploading and uh coding things like using hashtags and uh tagging other people and and just uh getting other people involved and right every time you add a new social media device you you kind of have to figure out a new way to to incorporate all those things which are essentially the same you know you want to you want to involve other people uh you want to share your message you get it out there um but there's there's always these uh learning curves that you have to i was just going to ask you how do you how do you go about learning it for the first time or if you're like oh this is a new thing i have no idea how to do it do you reach out to somebody do you watch youtube videos like what's the process yeah unless i have a friend that like knows a, a ton about it um which like my composer friends when i'm doing stuff uh big band writing and stuff like that there's still things i come across in sibelius which is the notation software that i use mm -hmm. where i'll just call them and ask them instead of trying to find it on youtube or some kind of forum because that we all are doing the same thing and have it's like a very specific niche but for the most part um i hate to say it and it, it kind of makes you even more isolated you can find just about anything you want to learn uh, especially if you're just learning a new app or something like that uh on youtube just uh, there's pretty much everybody has made or there's you know you'll find a couple different versions of it uh some kind of how-to video yeah i kind of use a combination i mean that's my go-to i mean the reason i i just asked you specifically is because you know, people that aren't so familiar with playing around in the digital world, they, they might feel a little bit like really overwhelmed with trying to figure it out, you know, and that's where I start. I always start with YouTube, how to do this. So I, at least I get educated. And if there's a quick answer, I can find it rather than annoying my friends <laughs> right away and say like, oh, that's so easy. You could have just done this, you know. Um, so you kind of like fill in the background and then I and then I go shoot for the uh, expert uh, experts out there that I know. So, okay. So you're you know, you, you jump back out of, out of New York, you're kind of pivoting and learning these skills because you got some projects that are, that maybe you were doing or in the pipeline. Like, I'm kind of curious as to like, you know, all your live music gigs go away, performances, and maybe you had a couple things, you know, that you wanted to do with video, for example, or just things you wanted to produce and get out there just in terms of creating content. But what about generating income in terms of like, how is that working? Or are you or you're just kind of just hunkered down for now and waiting for things to come back. I mean, yeah, well, um, I'm sure, you know, things about this, but like I, what I'm working towards right now and what I think a lot of my peers are, are the ones that are, you know, more internet savvy mm -hmm. is trying to get my YouTube channel monetized. Okay. Which from what I've heard can take a while. It can take, you know, a long time, but there's probably quicker routes to get there. But, um, if you get a thousand subscribers and then you get four thousand watch hours within this, the time period of a year, you become eligible for monetization, which just means they they will show commercials on your channel and on all your videos, and then um, you'll get paid a percentage of however much that commercial cost or however many views that commercial got or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I still don't completely understand it, so I'm kind of working towards that right now. But in the meanwhile, I'm I've made a bunch of online PDF material and just made available all my stuff uh, for people to purchase uh, at, you know, relatively cost-effective price point so that uh, people can realize that it's it's not just something that I'm, I'm like, hey, I need money, you know, buy my PDF. It's something that they're going to hopefully learn something from. And if they're people that are, you know, trying to better themselves and 
with all this isolation and all this, they're, they're going to be, it's going to be kind of a win-win, you know, like I'm, I'm giving away 20 years worth of information, uh, for $10. So I've, I've made six PDFs, uh, and that's something I want to do for a long time and I just haven't really had the time to do it. So in a way, you know, it's funny, like, even though I'm not working, playing music live, uh, performing as much, I'm. I feel like I'm working more at home now than I ever have. Um, just trying to get all these things up and running, and um, working towards these things like the monetization, and and it, it works that way on a couple different platforms. Like Spotify is the same way. I don't know exactly what the numbers are for that, mm-hmm. uh, but if you get enough plays, you they'll pay you for stuff, and it's the same way with uh, Apple Music on iTunes, and there's there's just so much to learn and. Uh, there are pe- people that have been utilizing this stuff for years now, and uh, as a musician, you know, I, I feel like I would have liked to learn that in college or, you know, somewhere along the line. But I was doing okay just playing live gigs, so I didn't really need to know that information. But now I, uh, I see a couple of my friends who have had that stuff in place for years now, and they're, I don't think they're really affected too much by this whole thing. And if anything, they're making more money now because more people are watching their videos now, and more people are checking out their content. Yeah, I think I think that's the case in terms of uh, you know everybody's got a little extra free time now, perhaps, or you're staying home and you're closer to your technologies, and uh, yeah, so the eyeballs are out there, <laughs> and the and uh, and probably the value is out there that's being created because people are engaging with you more and et cetera. And it's really, you know, that's kind of just the way I see the world. Obviously, you know, the podcast is called the Reinvention Revolution for a reason, where it's like you know we need to kind of pivot into this technology rather than be afraid of it or not understand it or not take the time to, to figure out where the value is for you. I mean, you don't need to know everything, but there's probably a couple of key things that you're probably finding out right now with like, you know, developing your YouTube channel or the PDFs or how to have a website that people can pay you through just the payment channels and all those kinds of things just to kind of like, Oh, it's not that hard. And if you just take the time to do it, it can really be fruitful, especially with the, the the chaos that's <laughs> that we're confronted with for the moment in terms of this virus stuff, so cool. Well, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you in terms of now that you're producing more videos, I, you know, and um, the videos are cool, dude. Okay, <laughs> so it re- it's really good stuff, and I just feel like you know I don't know uh, if it's something in the water here in Ohio, whatever, but there's always incredible musicians that come from Ohio. And, and some of the top saxophone players in particular are from Ohio. Like I had uh, Bobby Salvaggio on the show a few months back, one of the great, you know, I think, improvisers on alto today that, that's out there. And I think you're yeah. one, of, one of the uh, great uh, tenor improvisers, um, as, as well as alto. Because I first when I first met you, you were playing alto, but you seem to be playing more tenor these days. Anyways, these videos that you're in are incredible. And you've been recording some things like with this big band, uh, like the Chad Lefkowitz Brown big band. Like a CLB, yeah. And I wanted to ask you about that because, um, how do you put this technology together? Okay, <laughs> so like, I know you, I know how to record video, I know how to record audio, but what's going on behind the scenes to put this big band together, where all these people are in, you know, maybe eighteen different locations, but they're all they all show up on video in their little box, and it all sounds beautiful, and they're all playing together. And I know timing wise, you can't do this live over the internet, right? There's too much propagation delay and so you know, yeah. this is kind of some of the behind the scenes stuff that I want to know that hopefully people out there listening can can use in their in their real lives, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um and it's funny, it's one of those things where it's not as difficult as it seems, but um there are some elements of it that are very tedious and uh, can be time consuming specifically for the person editing the audio and the person editing the video. Um, I do a lot of self editing. Like when I send off a track on my own, I, I go in and I make sure it's, it's synced exactly. And I don't know, um, I can't speak for everybody in the big band video that uh, whether they're doing that or not, mm-hmm. But basically where it starts is with the track. So whoever the arranger is, um, in this case it was Stephen Feifke for those Chad Lefkowitz Brown videos, uh, he would send off a track that um, provides you know MIDI sounds or whatever. Okay. And then you can load that. That track is very you know metered and very in time. So pretty much everybody in the band played along to that track separately, individually. So the thing that becomes an issue is 
make sure all the videos are shot in the same you know format. They ought to be shot you know vertically or horizontally. If they're not, then that's going to create a lot more work for whoever's editing the video. I see. Uh, and um, making sure the frames per second is the same and the resolution is the same because that's going to also create some funky views. You know, um, if one of the squares is grainy and one of them's not, so. Those are all instructions that we got as part of the email. They didn't send those instructions the first time because those were complications that arose from the first video. So they're like, okay, okay we'll, we'll be a little more specific for the second one. And then for the audio, uh, well, it's, I think what we did is everybody sent audio and video separately. And you'll notice if, if there's somebody in, in any of those squares that's not using a microphone, uh, what they end up doing, and this is like a kind of a behind the scenes thing for sure is they actually end up miming. They record their part, record their audio, and then you end up miming the audio along with the, the track. And that's only for the reason so that it, it actually ends up looking and sounding better because you can sync the audio from the, the quote unquote video track. Mm-hmm. It, you'll have the audio playing behind it. So it, it syncs perfectly. It's just syncing two audios together basically. Gotcha. Um, okay. If that makes any sense. So you're, yeah, if you're just miming the, the video track, then um, you you create a lot less uh, problems uh, tactically. The problem is if you're not a good mimer, you're gonna like you're faking right. <laughs> faking the video. And then there's there's also some guys that don't. Yeah, there's also some guys that don't have to do that, or they just play so well they can get it right on both takes and have video and record the audio at the same time. But I think that that could take that would take me a lot longer to do it that way. Right. Yeah. But yeah, so. Everybody's just basically playing along to the same track, and then you kind of rely on the audio and video editors to do a lot of the behind the scenes to make it look really nice and make it sound really nice. I see. I gotcha. Uh, but uh, there, there is a certain level of like basic gear that everybody needs to have, and, and that would be, I would say, like Logic. You have to have Logic or some kind of, you know, recording software that is going to be able to be able to generate a click for you to play in time to. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think most of us were using our phones for the recording. Like, everybody was just recording the video on their iPhones. I see. Okay. So nothing special there in terms of the video. Yeah. No. No, yeah. surprisingly not. Like, um, And it, part of that is just a testament to Apple and, like, how good their their equipment is. Uh, because I, I, I've shot some videos, and I'll have people ask me specifically, like, what kind of video camera did you use? And I'm just using an iPhone 7. And right. it's not even, like, the camera on the 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 shoot side of the phone is the the selfie side of the phone which usually right. is not as good of a camera I don't know if they're the same one or not but yeah usually it's lower spe- lower specs mm-hmm. yeah so I've had people ask me like what camera are you using and it's just iPhone seven yeah it's pretty amazing I remember when the iPhone five came out and I was out at a at a bar back in the days when you could go to a bar and listen to live music. <laughs> uh, I was at a bar, a bar checking out this band and there was a video crew that showed up to do a video of the band and they were shooting it all on iPhone fives. So there was no, and this was, I don't know what year this was probably, you know, 10 years ago around by now uh, or eight years ago. Um, yeah. There was no like video cameras and special things that they needed. I, I was like, I was kind of shocked in a way, but at the same time I was like, Oh man, I love this. That's amazing. That's it. They, I mean, there was yeah. a whole videographer crew, and they were just walking around holding their phones, and they, you could you could almost not even tell them apart from the crowd because they were just <laughs> shooting on their phones. But uh, and I watched the videos later of it, and it was like, wow, it came out great, you know. So yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting with these these tools we have today. Well, cool. Well, thanks thanks for sharing that because I think you know people need some ideas or or some motivation of like, hey, maybe I need to explore this whole technology scene a little bit more, and maybe that's really the future in some ways of continuing to make a living as, as a working musician or continuing to put out content. Obviously, I mean, Instagram's out there, YouTube's out there, uh, you know, there's plenty of other streaming platforms, Periscope and all these things, uh, Twitch that, you know, this is the, wor- this is the way the world's going. So, you know, in a way, maybe it's nice to have some concentrated time to dig into this stuff. Cause I think it'll be fruitful going forward. But along, along those lines, I, I got, a, I got a question for you in terms of you know, you've been doing all these gigs and you, and you have what's cool. I think for, for you, it's like, I, I think I see a little bit of myself in you, just not that I'm at your level, but in terms of the things I like to do. So like, I'd like to do a lot of different types of music where, you know, you were like doing some hardcore, you know, shredding jazz, some fusion stuff, some pop stuff, um, a lot of different settings and different gigs like that. 
But how do you see yourself like moving forward in terms of, do you want to keep doing all of those various things? Do you want to concentrate more on a, like a solo career kind of going forward or teaching or what are your thoughts? Are, has this given you some time to, to kind of refocus or be a little more intentional about how you might think about things going forward? Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, performance wise, you know, that's, that's definitely a change that would need to happen, especially if I was going to, was going to have to stay away from New York for any length of time. I'd have to figure out, you know, a way to connect with people and, and to play for people aside from a jazz quintet format. So definitely, uh, been thinking about, you know, different avenues, but it, it's like you said, like, I, and I, I dig that you're the same way. I think that's probably part of why we get along so well is there's not really any specific genre that I, I'm like a huge fan of just as long as I get to improvise and, you know, kind of emote through that vehicle. Well, I'm, I'm happy playing any style of music that's out there. One of the things I've really been thinking about doing lately, a lot of is just soloing over tracks. Um, you know, just because I've been messing around with Logic so much lately, I've kind of realized that I can make a track pretty quickly and easily and avoid copyright issues sure. because I would just take such a small piece of the track mm -hmm. uh, that you can still recognize the song, you know what song it is, but you don't hear, you know, all the elements of the actual song. So I wouldn't really get into, I don't think, any trouble for it. Um, and then, you know, kind of bringing people into what jazz is, what improvisation is, uh, and all those things, you know, just things that I love and drawing them into that world, uh, using songs that they like, you know, and even right. going as far as like taking suggestions for whatever song they would want to hear. Well, cool. Well, cool. Well, okay. So I, so I have this question for you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to ask it because I'm not sure. Don't insult me, Jimmy. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to insult you. <laughs> But I have a question for you, which I'm not sure what your answer. No, that's fine. Is. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what your answer is going to be, but uh, it was just a, a funny thing that I was like when I was kind of researching, thinking about what, what things I wanted to ask you today is, and maybe I can I can write read a quote from your website to put this in context, okay? So for everybody that's listening out there doesn't know all the breadth and depth of uh, Steve Cortica, which is which is a lot, and, and I'm not, and I don't say that facetiously. So uh, here's your quote uh, from your bio. Based out of Astoria, New York, Steve Cortica is an accomplished multi-instrumentalist, composer, educator, and full-time performer. Steve is a main member of the Brian Newman Quintet Quartet, one of New York City's modern working bands holding multiple residencies throughout the city and earning a living, uh, performing the classic standards of yesteryear with a modern twist to them. The Grammy award-winning albums Cheek to Cheek, which I believe was Tony Bennett's and Lady Gaga's collaboration, and Tony Bennett celebrates his 90th, in, and that was released in, sorry, Cheek to Cheek was released in 2014. Tony Bennett celebrates his 90th in 2016, features Steve's arranging work on Firefly, I Can't Give You Anything But Love, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered, and La Vie and Rose. I love that song. Steve is also featured performing an improvised solo on Irving Berlin's classic, Let's Face the Music and Dance. Okay, so that, you know, kind of just frames the, some of the things that you've been into, but what stuck struck uh, stuck out to me there was it says the Grammy Award winning, winning albums Cheek to Cheek and Tony Bennett celebrates ninety and that you had had some work on them. So, do you have a Grammy Award, dude? Do you get a Grammy for this? Did I did I miss something? Yeah, I can. No, I I, I do. I just I don't. I feel like it's their Grammy, so I feel odd, you know, taking credit for the for the award because they you know. They're there. I'm not on every track of those albums. I'm only on one track of the Tony album. They are amazing albums, and I think I am really proud of what we what we played and the arrangements I got to do on them. Uh, the Grammy committee or whatever it is, they don't actually send me a plaque or anything like that. They'll send you a certificate, and, and I think you have to pay like a hundred dollars for it. So I haven't oh, really? gone through that whole process, but uh, a couple of the guys in the band have, and they have it on their wall and stuff. And, oh, really? Um, I'm super proud they, of. They don't send you a little a, a little Grammy statue. They don't send you one. I, I I don't know if I kicked and screamed I might be able to get one I'm sure but it's uh, some battles are left on I see and, well because I fought. it shouldn't be a battle in, in my opinion well right well because I, I really wanted to know like if you have one how do you fit it in your case in my sax case like if you have a Grammy award <laughs> do you carry it around with I don't know you probably don't carry it, probably don't probably don't carry it around with you but okay yeah. well that's pretty cool I don't I don't know if I realize that like. Uh, that I know somebody that 
it has a Grammy award. Oh, that's cool, man. I love that. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, so it's, cool. it, it's exciting. And in, in, in his, um, to his credit, I would, anything Tony records in the last like 20 years, I would say has gotten the Grammy award. Uh, he's been doing a lot of these collaboration albums and they've gotten it down to a science, uh, right. where they can figure out how to get, um, just a ton of different listeners by reaching a, a, a lot of different fan bases. And it's mostly through collaborations. And the, and the whole Tony Bennett Lady Gaga collaboration was kind of a brilliant one for both of their careers and couldn't have happened at a better time for them. So that was like uh, kind of a no brainer for them to get the Grammy. Uh, they were the best traditional pop album, I think, is the category they fall under. Mm -hmm. uh, vocals, maybe, is the extra piece of that. But um, yeah, there's just nobody that can touch them uh, so anything that they're associated with is going to get a grammy as long as they put a full album out um but yeah I'm, it's it's a huge honor i'm just definitely happy to have been yeah, a part of all of it well cool man well i'm glad i'm glad i did my research so now that i, I I'm, I'm even more impressed now okay so <laughs> uh that's cool so it doesn't mean i'm gonna stop you know breaking your balls or anytime soon but i'm just saying okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh well that's really cool well so anyways, where I was going with this was I was looking at your website and I didn't understand. And, you know, if you re remember, just read, you know, re rewind the tape and, and listen to that, this quote again about, I didn't understand the breadth and depth of all the stuff that you've really been into the last few years. So that, you know, obviously that's some pretty major stuff right there, uh, being on Grammy award winning stuff. Uh, but you've also been able to you know, kind of coordinate and head these other different types of smaller jazz groups and do some writing on your own. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, your kind of solo career or your career of composing and arranging. I don't know how you want to look at it, you know, if you're pushing that or not, but I know you had your, your own releases and you just released um, a CD recently, or was it video? Tell me, tell me what's going on with the, with your solo stuff. Yeah, sure. The the thing I did recently, I mean, it could have just been a, a studio recording audio wise. I had hired a videographer to come in and, and do video shoots of us recording the studio album. So uh, that works out great for just social media content. And that's what a lot of the uh, really successful younger musicians are doing today. And that's kind of seems to be the direction that everybody's headed in. So right. I wanted to make sure I just had video uh, footage of, of that as well, just to document it. Uh, and it's been great for my for my YouTube presence, uh, but just over over the years and, and part of uh, being a jazz musician, I think part, an essential part of being a jazz musician uh, from the creative aspect of it is uh, writing your own music is really helps me grow it and, and just think more creatively, I think, about how to approach the standards that I play uh, every week when I perform. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not the only reason I do it. I, I, I think you just find a, a more personal path to expression uh, by writing your own music. So uh, I've been, I, I started, I think I wrote my first song in 2007 or 2008, and it's actually called Basso Luca. Uh, I, wrote it, I wrote it for Luca Mendaka because I oh. had been coming back to Cleveland a lot. Mm -hmm. And I got to play like maybe like four or five gigs with her when I was working on cruise ships. I would come back and like just kind of be bored. And not, that's I think that's when we when we met right uh, at Velvet Tango Room. I, I was able to line some gigs up with Luca in in one of those trips home. And after playing her tunes, like it, it was just like so easy easy to write it. And I was just so thankful to get to hear her play like so much original music and get to play with it. Um, that. I realized, you know, as I was writing this tune, I was like, you know, this all this stuff is just stuff I heard Luca play in her music. And um, I had pieced it together in a different way, obviously, and it became its own tune. Uh, but that was kind of where it all started for me, was just, like, realizing how much fun that could be and um, taking, you know, harmonic devices that you really like and then just piecing them together a different way. And uh, I, I I get the most kick out of that. It's, it's, I think it's maybe one of the underappreciated sides of the jazz idiom is just like original music nobody really checks out originals with the same uh forever as they'll check out like somebody doing a cover of fly me to the moon right even though fly me to the moon's been done you know like 20 30 different times by 20 30 different people it has that familiar thing to it so everybody is going to go and listen to that song versus some song that nobody has ever heard before but from a creative standpoint i think it's much more satisfying to know that you like created the entire uh soundscape of 
the particular song, you know, and there's, there's definitely a huge learning curve, like with anything else with, with composition and learning how to make tools effective and make them sound good and make them not sound forced and all those things. But, um, I have about three or four studio albums that I've done over the year. One was a collaboration. That's why I say, or four, Mm -hmm. but, uh, all of them have just a bunch of original music and different, different things I've gone for over the years. Uh, that I've recorded, and uh, it's it's hard in New York to get gigs for those ensembles, just because they don't uh, get a lot of traction for the reasons I said. You know, that there are people that do it, and they they are amazing in the, in the in the genre, uh, but it just it takes like a full time commitment of doing that. And because I've been performing with Brian so much, and uh, just have to pay bills and put put food on the table i haven't really had enough time to push my own career but it's definitely something i love and i think the music's good you know i think it's great it's like <laughs> right well i think this this last one I, I had a chance to listen to a little bit the last last few days and it's cool man i mean there's some really like shredding stuff on there really intense kind of fusiony stuff like funky there's a you know a couple, yeah a few funky tunes like it's not um you know, it's not as esoteric as some of the real modern, you know, kind of stuff where it's, you know, super complex and harmonically complex and all that stuff. It, there's some accessibility to it. I think that's what I, I like in your playing. It's, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're very sophisticated in terms of skill level and what you're doing, but you still, um, the fun and style still comes through, you know what I mean? And that's, that's cool to me. And that, I think that helps to engage more, more, more people than it just being like a heady jazz trip kind of thing, you know? Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, it really, it really does. So, you know, if you're out there, check it, check, check out his stuff, of course. Well, uh, Steve, we got a, a few minutes left on the podcast before we get out of here. Though, there's always a, a few questions I like to uh, ask people, um, kind of where their where their heads at and how they're thinking about the world these days. And one of them is, you know, with respect to technology. Obviously, we all, you know, needed to pivot into this digital world a, a bit more than we normally would, maybe just just a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, but how, how do you think about technology going forward about about dealing with it and, you know, the benefits or drawbacks or, you know, what do you see there or maybe some of the challenges or just things that pop out to you now that you're kind of really getting more immersed in it? Yeah, uh, the, I guess I, I don't see a ton of um, drawbacks to it other than, you know, you can spend all day making videos and not see a single person, but the whole point of making the videos is to reach a lot of people so i think there's definitely like a, a disconnect that's happening as as we travel more into this um this digital world you know you're you're socializing it's a very social thing but it, you're also not talking to anybody as you're doing it you know mm-hmm. you're just talking to a screen basically and you're it's your audience that you're imagining um as far as like uh the count any kind of technical issues I, I i think that a lot of the stuff like we talked about earlier is out there you know and and how to access it and how to do it is out there uh and i think the only real issue is just spending the time and um teaching yourself the new skill sets and how to do it uh i think over t- over the you know the next five years or something things are going to get hopefully more streamlined on on all all the apps and maybe some apps will merge or so you know it everything should probably be become easier to use or more user-friendly and as as you become more educated with the technology, you know, everything becomes easier on that. There's the, the learning curve gets less as, as you learn more things about just any different app. So, uh, I, I don't know. I see a lot of positives. I'm, I'm very, I've always kind of tried to hold a positive, uh, viewpoint, um, any situation. And I, I can, I can see how this can bring people together, uh, in just ways that you couldn't have imagined before uh, the, the virus happened. Right, right. Well, certainly it's um, it makes things a lot more, I guess, palatable or just uh, you know easier to deal with now that we're all isolated. So it helps. It really yeah. does help people uh, keep connected and and really keep commerce flowing. Keep your you know keep cash flowing around the world too. You know, like you know, if everybody just had to go home and really had no way to continue on with their lives in some respects, I mean, that would really be a rougher situation than we, than we all have it right now. So at least you know teachers can you know still keep teaching students and and uh you know you can still keep trading you know pdfs around the world and get paid for it and compensated and all those kinds of things um you know one one thing i i i, I kind of I, I didn't ask you about earlier in terms of uh performing 
is live performance. So I know I noticed you've done a lot of um, video collaborations that are like pre-recorded and like kind of produced sort of events. Have you done any live things? I, I've noticed that uh, Brian has done a few live streaming kind of concerts. There, there's a few platforms out there that that maybe lend themselves to doing that. Obviously, you can do a Facebook Live or a YouTube Live kind of thing. Um, what, what do you think about the live aspect of performing right now? Uh, I think those are cool, I, and I think it's a great idea, uh, and people still really enjoy those. They get a kick out of them uh, f- from a fan base standpoint. I think it's important that, that a lot of anybody who's an artist or a performer considers themselves one should definitely be doing those those things at least once every other week. Uh, the one that Brian uses is called Stage It, and I haven't gotten around to doing it yet, but um, it's really cool. You, you just sell a limited amount of tickets. I think it's like 45 to 60 tickets or something like that. And uh, that way this, the show sells out or whatever. It, it has like the, the feel of like a real performance. Mm-hmm. And um, what he ends up doing on those, and I think a lot of people, is just making backing tracks and playing along to those, but playing things that you would perform regularly and you kind of push yourself to come up with new things within that format um to play uh and the the, i guess the only drawback is you know it's it's all pre-recorded stuff so the the only performers that are going to be on it are whoever's you're quarantined with at the time right right uh versus like the collaboration you can you can kind of collect it's it's still premeditated but you you can you know quote unquote play with more people with these collaborations but I th- yeah, I think I really dig it. Actually, I, I I think it's cool. When when this first had started, I, I was I was thinking about going in that direction where I was going to do like a live stream every other day or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was cool. But then some other things kind of just fell into my lap, and I uh, started just really getting into the the YouTube stuff. Um, and I I I've been uploading a lot of videos lately. But I think once I'm done with that, I'm going to definitely go back to the live live streaming thing. Um, but you know, all these different apps like YouTube has a live one. Uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, they, they all have live streaming features, which which are great, and they all have their, their own, like, you know, positives and negatives to them. But, yeah, I think it's, it's awesome. I got you. Okay, so maybe coming soon, so we'll watch for the live streams. <laughs> so, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably in the next, like, two, I would say in, like, a week or so, I'm going to start live streaming just different, different projects that I've been uh, thinking about. Right, right. I gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I'm starting to, you know, like I really had not gotten into video much for myself. I've done some live streams with the, you know, in connection with the podcast a little bit. Um, but yeah, I was trying to start just recording myself a little bit just on the music side. I'm starting to kind of post a few bit videos. So I have a couple of them recorded and I, that I finally figured out how to post them. I had to connect my iPad and whatever, get some passwords and stuff, <laughs> uh, all talking to each other. But yeah, I think it's just there's a lot to explore. So I, I don't think we were, you know, we're sitting around or being bored at all. It's just a, 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 just a pivot that we all have to make for the moment in terms of, you know, how do you deal with live performance or, or those type of things going forward? Well, I got, I got one final question for you. Usually I ask people about, you know, how, how, what they've learned through their reinventions, but I think we're all just, we're in this real expansion mode and exploration mode in terms of reinvention right now. And so I think a more interesting question for the moment is what are you urgent about? Or maybe you can read that as what are you having anxiety about? Like, how are you feeling like in this kind of moment in time? Like, do you feel like I got to take advantage of this or I'm overwhelmed? Um, How are you feeling? Yeah, I think in general, I've kind of had this always this underlying wants to, to, create more stuff you know to practice more i can always get better at stuff and i don't know where that exactly comes from i'm definitely inspired by hearing other great musicians uh and stuff like that and i don't think that it's any different now than it has been but my my biggest urge right now is to just um create more uh content just because i know that i have it in my head and i want to i want to get it out there as far as like feeling anxiety about the uh the situation um that it kind of just depends on how long it goes on for you know i just i just hope that everybody uh is alive and well you know and like dealing with it well Mm -hmm. uh because i know that it i I, it goes in like little bursts or like waves for me where i'll i'll feel like oh my god like what what if this goes on forever you know that that kind of feeling but 
I I know deep down that it won't, and that um, we always bounce back even when like large scale epidemics have hit. Um, they always I'm sure they change they change things temporarily, but I I do think we'll be back at some kind of normalcy in, in the next couple of years. Um, hopefully it doesn't take that long, but uh, it's hard to it's hard to think about that when you're in the midst of a something like this. But um, I I have been pretty good over the years of just doing my mind out of those places because there's a lot of things to worry about in the world even despite our immediate situation uh but i i try to just focus on the things that i can do well or just make better you know right right um so i haven't luckily i haven't really experienced a ton of anxiety about it yet but i i don't know so i just trained myself to think that way over right the years I, right i got you yeah i mean i you know i'm kind of looking at this as like you know Maybe this is just a sabbatical year in some ways of performing or, or whatever, kind of doing that gig thing and gives you an opportunity to explore some other things. Like you said, get some other creative, you know, juices flowing and get that, you know, different types of content out or whatever. So, yeah, and I'll and I'll be looking for whatever you start, you know, continue to produce or it's your, your live stuff that's coming that you want to dig into. You know, if people are, are interested in, in finding out more about you or following you, or you know, looking for the for the next thing from Steve Cortica. Where would you where would you send them? How should they get in touch with you? Yeah, I would say um, the best way to do that right now, and probably for the at least the next year or so, is just go to my YouTube channel and and follow it. Uh, if you have a YouTube channel, um, if not, you can subscribe to my website, and I'll be sending out a newsletter uh, probably every month or two months or something, just giving all the updates of the new videos and the new things that I've created, but. Website is just my name, www.stevecortica.com. Uh, and then, then yeah, my YouTube channel, if you just Google uh, Steve Cortica YouTube, that should come up. Um, but it's all going to be there for the most, for the most part. I, I'm going to take like the really good things that I'm proud of and put them on my site just to showcase them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, cool, <laughs> man. Well, all that, all that information will be in the show notes, of course. So you can always go to Jim Jim's reinvention revolution.com and find it there. Or if you're, you know, if you're listening to the, uh, podcast on YouTube or in a podcast app, however you listen to podcasts, those links are, should be clickable. They are, they are clickable in most, most of the applications. So you can continue listening while you're checking out Steve's website, for example. So, you know, give that a shout out there. Well, Steve, thanks for being on the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, it would be great to see you in person sometime soon and, you know, hear you play again sometime soon, hopefully <laughs> here. If it's next year, so be it. But uh, anyways, great to connect with you. Yeah, man, I really appreciate it. Uh, you too, Jim. And, and uh, glad, to, glad that you're doing this and making this available for people. And uh, I look forward to talking more in the future. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of. Hey, revolutionaries, if you enjoyed today's episode and today's guest, let them know by commenting on their Facebook page finding their Twitter handle or Instagram feed and letting them know you heard them on Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast and tell them what you got out of the episode, what you really liked or how they inspired you. I know they would get a kick out of it and will help others find the same value that you found.